Okay, so in this video, we want to consider extending our basic notions of vectors to our n for any n, therefore r4, r5, r6, and beyond. And the question is, which natural geometric concept of vectors carry over in our n in higher dimensional spaces? Well, if you look at what we have developed so far in R2 or R3, so vectors in the plane or in three-dimensional space, we have the concept of the length of a vector, the angle between vectors, and then we had the algebra on vectors, and we had two fundamental vector operations. We had the dot product, and we had the cross product. Now, the cross product only works for R3, and we were able to make it work in R2 by embedding R2 in R3. But beyond R2 and R3, the cross product no longer works, so that's out of the picture. But we still have the dot product, right? We can still dot two vectors in Rn by multiplying corresponding entries and adding them up. So we still have our dot product. So the question is, with the help of the dot product, can we still carry over the geometry that we have developed in R2 and R3, can we carry that over to Rn? Because the algebra works exactly the same. You add vectors by adding corresponding entries. You multiply vectors by scalar by multiplying each entry by the scalar. So algebraically, nothing changes, whether you're in R2, R3, R4, or beyond. The question that is interesting is, does the geometry still work? So do we still have the concept of the length of a vector and the angle between two vectors? If we have this, then the geometry works the same as it did for R2 and R3. And remember that there's two ways to view our n algebraically. We can view our n as all sets, the set of all n tuples of real numbers. So x1, x2 up to xn, so we have a vector with n components. xi, i ranging from 1 to n, is an arbitrary real number. So x1 can be any real number, same for x2 up to xn. But we can also view our n as a set of column matrices of length n, x1, x2, up to xn. For now, we'll stick with this presentation of our n, but very shortly, we'll realize that a better presentation is this one. But for now, we'll stick with this one. So first question is, or at least I guess a review would be, let's go over our dot product. So if you let u and v be two vectors in Rn, so you can let u be the vector with components u1, u2, up to un. And here again, n is an arbitrary integer, positive integer. It could be 1, 2, 3, 47, doesn't matter. We have a vector with n components. And v also be a vector in Rn, v1, v2 up to vn, then the dot product still works the same. If you dot the vector u with v, you multiply corresponding entries and you add them up, so it will be u1 times v1 plus u2 times v2 up to un times vn. So we multiply corresponding entries of both vectors u and v, and we add them up. Of course, we can write this more concisely using our sigma notation. We are summing, well, ui times vi, and i ranging from 1 all the way up to n. And so we still have our dot product, and we have the same familiar properties of the dot product that we had proved in R2 or R3. And every property can be proved using basic properties of sigma notation, of summation. So all the basic properties of the dot product, I will leave the proofs to you using what you know already with sigma notation. The proofs are all very straightforward. What we want in this video is to consider the geometric notions about vectors. Well, first, if you remember, what was the length of a vector? It was Pythagoras' theorem, and the length of a vector was the sum, was the square root, of the sum of the components, all squared. Well, let's see if we can build the norm of a vector in Rn 
with the help of the dot product. What if we dotted u with itself? Well, this would be u1 times u1, u1 squared, plus u2 times u2, u2 squared, up to un times un, un squared. And if you think of it, well, the only way to extend the norm naturally in Rn is to do the same thing. The norm of vector u would be the square root of the sum of the entries squared. So it would be the root of u1 squared plus u2 squared up to un squared. This is exactly that, but without the square root. So this is just the norm of the vector u. Well, the square root is missing, therefore it's the norm squared. So, we naturally have an extension of the norm of a vector, taking the square root, the norm of a vector. So if I give you now an n-tuple of real numbers, x1 through xn or u1 through un, you can still think of this as an actual vector, as a narrow pointing in space, but now in n-dimensional space. So you can still view this tuple as, this n-tuple as a vector, and you may ask, well, what is the length of this vector? Well, taking the square root, it is simply the square root of the dot product between the vector and itself. And you see, with the help of the dot product, we have a natural extension of the norm through R4 and beyond. So the concept of length of a vector still makes sense. We have our dot product in the same way, and we can view an n-tuple of real numbers as a vector whose length, by Pythagoras' theorem, is the square root of the vector dotted with itself. So the concept of length still makes sense, but we're missing another fundamental concept, and that is the concept of angles. Do we still have angles in R4, R5, and beyond? And the answer is yes, but we'll have to extend the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So let's recall how we were able to find the angle between two vectors in R2 and R3. So if you have two vectors, u and v, that belong to either the two-dimensional space or the three-dimensional space, we had the familiar equality where the dot product between u and v was simply the norm of u, the norm of v, times the cosine of the angle between u and v, right? So if you visualize the, what you have, this is say vector u, this is say vector v, and you have the angle theta between u and v. So with the dot product, there was a very nice geometrical interpretation of the dot product between u and v, which was the length of u times the length of v times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. And from this, we can solve for the angle. We can solve for theta, right? So divide across by norm of u, norm of v. And so cos of theta is simply u dot v over the norm of u norm of v. Now what's great about this is this was for vectors in R2 or R3, but the dot product still makes perfect sense in Rn. So for two vectors in Rn, we can compute u dot v, and with the help of the dot product and Pythagoras' theorem, the norm still makes sense in Rn. So the right-hand side here makes perfect sense for vectors u and v in Rn for any n. So, so far it looks pretty good. Now, how do we get the angle? Well, we take the arc cosine on both sides, and so the angle will be the arc cosine of this expression right here, of u dot v over the norm of u times the norm of v. So it looks like everything is great. Given two vectors u and v now beyond R3, and R4, R5, or any n for that matter, u dot v still makes sense. Norm of u makes sense, norm of v makes sense. 
And so it seems that we can just take the arc cosine of this ratio, and that will be the angle between u and v. So the geometry of angles seem to also make sense. There is only one thing to be worried about here is, is the arc cosine defined for every real number? And the answer is no. Right? Remember that the cosine of an angle is always between 1 and negative 1. So cosine of anything is always between negative 1 and 1. And so the arc cosine, so the range of cosine of the, the range of the cosine function is negative 1 and 1. The range of cosine is negative 1 to 1. But our cosine is the inverse of the cos function. So the range of cosine is the domain of our cosine. So the arc cosine function has a domain between negative 1 and 1. So the arc cosine function only makes sense if what we have as an argument is between negative 1 and 1. Now we don't know, right? We haven't proved this. If we have two vectors in Rn and we compute this ratio, if the result is between negative 1 and 1, well, we can take the arc cos of this and everything is okay. But maybe the value of this quotient is bigger than 1 in absolute value, and the arc cosine is not defined, and the angle therefore is not defined. So that's a potential problem. Well, let's look at what this looks like if we rearrange it. We will have the angle between two vectors in Rn for any n, as long as the arc cosine of this ratio is defined, as long as, therefore, the ratio is between negative 1 and 1. So let's look at this. We need u dot v over the norm of u, norm of v, to be between negative 1 and 1. Well, if you think of it, if a number lies between negative 1 and 1, that's because its absolute value is at most 1. Now we don't need the absolute value on the whole quotient because this is already non-negative. So we need an absolute value u dot v over the norm of u norm of v to be at most 1. If you prefer, multiply across by norm of u norm of v and you get the following inequality. And this should look familiar. We call this, if you recall in R2 and R3, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. But the flaw in the argument here is that to prove this inequality, we used the fact that we already had the angle between two vectors, right? We used the fact that, the norm, that u dot v was the norm of u, norm of v, cos of the angle between the two vectors, and so an absolute value you get the absolute value of this, but cosine and absolute value is at most 1. Therefore, u dot v and absolute value is at most norm of u norm of v. So we already have proved this in R2 and R3. The question is now, well, will this still be true in Rn when n is bigger than 3, say 4, 5, and beyond? If this is true, then the ratio is between negative 1 and 1 always, and so the arc cosine of this will always make sense. And so we have now the concept of angles in Rn when n is bigger than 3. But we have to prove that this, that this inequality is true in Rn for any n. Let's prove it, but of course now we'll have to give a radically different proof than we did in R2 and R3, because we don't have the concept of an angle between two vectors. We're trying to make the concept work in R4 and beyond. So it's not proved Cauchy-Schwarz, 
n are n for any n. And as soon as we have this inequality, we have our concept of angles, and the geometry of vectors in Rn works the same for any n. We have the concept of length and the concept of angles, and so even though we can't visualize the vectors in R4 and beyond, we can still think of them as vectors that have length, directions, and angles. And now this is the general Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in our n for any n. So we now give a general proof. Well, let's just restate the inequality, which said that for any two vectors u and v in our n, the absolute value of their dot product will never exceed the product of the two individual norms. And that is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Let us now prove this, and the proof is actually really nice, but at the same time it's kind of a slick proof. It's not so obvious how to begin the problem. But if you could remember, if you dot a vector with itself, you get the sum of the components squared, so any vector dotted with itself will be a non-negative quantity. So the idea is let's consider the vector u minus t times vector v for any given real number t, and let's dot this with itself. If you dot a vector with itself, you have the sum of the entries of the vector squared, therefore this is non-negative for all real values t. Let's expand this and see what we get. We'll get u dot u minus t u dot v minus t v dot u, but u dot v is equal to v dot u, and so we get negative 2 u dot v times t, and finally plus or negative t v dotted with negative t v will give us plus t squared v dot v. Let's rewrite this in the opposite order. The t squared first, the multiple of t, and the constant term. And again, this is non-negative. So we'll have t squared. I'll write this first. So v dotted with v times t squared minus 2 u dot v times t plus u dotted with Okay, if you look at this now, there are two options. Either v, is this, either v is the zero vector, or v is not the zero vector. Well, let's consider the option of b, v being the zero vector. If v is the zero vector, then u dot v will be equal to zero, and so the left-hand side is zero. If v is the zero vector, the norm of the zero vector is zero, so both sides are equal to zero, therefore the inequality is valid. So if v is a zero vector, then the result is true. So we can now assume that we are in the other case, therefore that v is not the zero vector in Rn, therefore at least one of its components is not equal to zero. Because as we've just said, if v is a zero vector, the inequality is trivial for any vector u. And if you look, here's what's interesting, right? The vectors u and v are fixed vectors, so they're constants. So v dot v is just a real number, so we have a multiple. And because v is not the zero vector, the norm of v is not equal to zero. But the norm of v is the root of v dotted with v. And so v dot v is also non-zero, and it is a positive real number. This is the sum of the entries of v squared, and it is strictly positive. So look at what you have here. 
you have a positive constant multiple of t squared minus, well, another multiple, positive or negative, of t plus a constant term. This is a quadratic equation in t. It's just a parabola, and it's non-negative. So imagine visualizing what you have now. You have a quadratic in t, and you have the values of this quadratic, say along the y-axis, but the quadratic is always above zero, or in the worst case, it's equal to zero. So either it will look something like this, or there'll be a unique value of t where it will be equal to zero. That's one or the other, right? We have a quadratic in t, and it's always above zero, so it has to either be always strictly positive or only one time being equal to zero. So let's think about this. If we have such a quadratic, it means that we can only have at most two, at most one zeros, right? Here, we're always strictly positive, so here there are no zeros of this quadratic, and here there is only one zero. So these are the only two possibilities. So let's now look at the possible zeros of this quadratic using the quadratic formula. This equation is zero if and only if t is equal to negative b, so 2 u dot v, plus or minus the square root of this squared, which will give you 4 u dot v squared, So b squared minus 4ac. So minus 4 times v dot v times u dot u. So minus 4 v dotted with v, u dotted with u. So negative b plus or minus the root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. a is v dot v, so over 2 times v dotted with v. So these would be the two possible zeros of this quadratic. But now look at this. If what's inside the square root is strictly positive, then when we do this value, plus or minus the square root of this number, this will be a positive number, and this will give us two different zeros of the quadratic. But we know that we have either no zeros or only one, so what's inside cannot be strictly positive. And this is the crux of the argument. If this were a positive number, the square root would be strictly positive, and with the plus or minus we would get two distinct zeros of our quadratic polynomial. We know it's not the case, therefore what's inside has to be less than or equal to zero. And let's see what comes out of this. So 4 u dot v squared minus 4 v dot v times u dot u must be at most zero. Let's rearrange this now. We can divide across by 4 Cancel the 4. 0 over 4 is 0. This term here is centered on the other side, and you'll have plus v dot v u dot u. And so you'll have on the left-hand side u dot v squared is at most v dot v times u dot u. Let us rewrite the left-hand side. And now if you remember, if you dot a vector with itself, what you have is the norm of the vector squared. I'll write this first. This is the norm of u squared. And v dot v, same thing as the norm of v squared. 
both sides are squared, and because the square root is an increasing function, we can take the square root on both sides, and this will preserve the inequality. We have to be a little careful, though. Norm of u, norm of v are always non-negative, so here we can take the square root, and there's no problem. So we get norm of u, norm of v. u dot v, though, could be negative. So here, if you take the square root of this, you don't just get u dot v. You get something a little different, because if you square something, then take the square root, what you have done is killed a potential negative sign. So that is not just u dot v, but it is the absolute value of u dot v. And there you have it. The absolute value of u dot v will be at most the norm of u times the norm of v. And if you go back, this is the result that we are after. And so we have Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in our n for any positive integer n. And because of this now, the concept of angles carry over, carries over perfectly. This implies that u dot v over the norm of u times v If I drop the absolute value, this will be between 1 and negative 1. So the equality we had developed in R2 and R3 now makes also perfect sense in Rn. We can write now in Rn, as we did for R2 and R3 for any n, that u dot v is the norm of u times the norm of v times the cosine of the angle between are two vectors u and v. Even though u and v may have 20 components, this still makes perfect sense now. So you can still imagine the vector u, even if it had, say, five components, and the vector v five components, you can still imagine these five tuples of real numbers as two arrows in five-dimensional space. They both have a length, and they have an angle between the two. And the angle, as we have derived previously will be the arc cosine of u dot v over the norm of u, the norm of v. And again, the only reason, and this is why this inequality is so important, this is really a fundamental inequality. Without proving the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in Rn for any n, we would have no clue of how big or small this can be, and we could not extend the concept of angles to higher dimensional spaces. But because we have just now proved that this inequality, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, holds in our n for any n, then the direct consequence of this inequality is that this ratio, u dot v over norm of u norm of v, is always between negative 1 and 1, and that is exactly the domain of the arc cosine function. The arc cosine function is only defined for values between negative 1 and 1. But because of Cauchy-Schwarz, this will always be between negative 1 and 1. And so the arc cos of this number always makes sense. And therefore, the concept of angles between two vectors always makes sense in Rn for any n. And this is why this inequality is so important. Out of this algebraic inequality, we get the geometric notion of angles between two vectors. And this is kind of wild if you think of it, right? An algebraic inequality between two vectors gave rise to the geometric concept of an angle between two vectors. And this is a nice example of algebra giving birth to geometry. There is one last nice consequence of this, which is a very simple one, but a very important one. If I give you two vectors, say in R7, and I ask you, are the two vectors perpendicular or not? Well, two vectors are perpendicular if the angle between them is pi over 2, but cosine of pi over 2 is 0, 
therefore this is equal to zero, therefore u dot v would have to be zero. So this works as before in R2 and R3. Two vectors in Rn, u and v, can only be perpendicular to each other if and only if the angle is pi over 2, cos of pi over 2 is 0, therefore if their dot product is equal to 0. So there you have it. Our conclusion is that when we deal with vectors in Rn, we can still think of Rn for any n as a space of vectors, but now the vectors have n components. The length still makes sense. The length of a vector is the square root of the vector dotted with itself. This was our first geometric realization. The length of a vector is the root of the vector dotted with itself. And because of the cauchy schwarz inequality in Rn, this number right here will always be between negative 1 and 1, so the arc cosine will always be defined. And so the angle between two vectors in Rn makes perfect sense. And we have the equality now being valid for vectors in R2, R3, and beyond. And a very nice consequence of this is two vectors in n-dimensional space are perpendicular to each other if and only if their dot product is equal to zero. So whenever you deal with vectors in Rn, it's not because we can't visualize R4, R5, and beyond that we cannot think of the vectors as being actual pointy arrows in space that have length, directions, and angles. And all of this due to two things, our dot product and cauchy schwarz inequality. So keep this in mind, through algebra, the dot product and cauchy schwarz inequality, both of these algebraic operations have given rise to geometric concepts, geometric notions of vectors in higher dimensional spaces.